For those of you who are watching online, we welcome you, and we're glad that you've tuned in with us tonight, because this, we are in the fight of our lives right now for the United States of America and for our Christian foundations. Everything, it seems, is on the table, and there is such a battle that we are facing. Even today, as I was watching the news, I saw more and more uh, rivalry and actually antagonism against the president. And uh, there is just an amazing battle in the spirit. It's a, it's a clash of two kingdoms. And I trust that the church will wake up and see it. This is a time not for division in the church, although I'm sorry to say that there is division in the church. The same division that's in our society is crept into the church. Some church leaders refuse to talk about the issues because they don't want to divide their churches. But we have to speak the truth. And the Lord is going to shake us and shake us and shake us until we come together. And uh, we need this unity. You know, the redwood trees in California are the tallest trees in the world. Some of them are 300 feet tall. This ceiling is 50 feet. And it's really high. But just think of 300 feet. That means six times the height of this ceiling. But do you know those trees, those redwood trees, have really shallow roots that only go down six feet in the ground? A tree 300 feet up and only roots that go down six feet. But the roots spread out far and wide. And you know what they do? They intertwine with the roots of the other redwoods. Like they're, like they're holding arms together. So that when the wind blows and you know, all kinds of climate comes against those trees, they stand firm. Because of the unity they have in their foundations. And we need that in the church. That's really a picture of what the church should be like. We should be unmovable, connected together. We have to look at what things are true and what things are praiseworthy and what things are glorious and of virtue. And those are the things we should speak about. And we should be in unity, regardless of the color of our skin or what denomination we come from. The church of Jesus Christ should not be, we should refuse to be divided at such a time as this. And we should look at those things not protecting ourselves because of personalities or because of skin color or something like that. But we should be above that. We should say, as for me and my nation, we will serve the Lord. And these are the principles of the Word of God and we're sticking with them. And we're not going to be divided. The, the devil can't get between us and can't separate us. So those of you who are watching online, if you're struggling with this today, I encourage you to humble yourself and to be one with the people of God and don't allow any kind of division to come. Open your Bibles with me now, please, to Psalm 119, starting at verse 43. And I'm going to read from verse 43 down to verse 47. And the title of this message is God's Non-Negotiables for Nations. God's non-negotiables for nations. And here we're going to start reading now in Psalm 119, verse 43. Do not snatch the word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. I will always obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom for I have sought out your precepts. I will speak of your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame, for I delight in your commands because I love them. Can you say amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious word. And we are word of God people, and we preach the word tonight. We thank you for these words of the psalmist. 
who looks to you and loves your law and loves your precepts and loves your ways and loves your freedom and will speak them forth to authorities, the statues of the Lord, they will speak forth to kings. And the word is, do not allow that word to be taken from my mouth. But don't snatch it from my mouth, but let it be proclaimed. And that's what we have been doing over these last few months. I know for some people, it has been uncomfortable for us to speak about things that go beyond Jesus, Jesus, meek and mild, and start to speak in defense of his word and his the defense of his precepts and his laws and his statutes, especially as we come towards this election. Well, the title of this message is a continuation of this theme, to fight for godly virtue and principles in the land. So I have called this sermon, God's Non-Negotiables for Nations. And there are three that stand out. For nations. Now, if we were to talk about non negotiables for us, we could say there is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. And that's non negotiable. You can only get to heaven through Jesus Christ. But when we talk about nations, what are the things that nations have to do to be in step with God? And I'm going to give you three things, just three. One of them, is marriage, a biblical kind of marriage. And the second is life. Life must be protected. So marriage must be supported, a biblical marriage. Life must be protected. And the third thing is Israel. Believe it or not, Israel, God insists that nations bless Israel. And if we do these three things, if we guard the, the marriage between a man and a woman, and we fight for life in every place where it is being attacked, and we protect life, and we honor and bless Israel, then God will bless our nation. And by and large, for many years, this nation has done pretty good at those things. But right now, we are facing and have faced for these 70 years or so this abortion problem in our land, this horrific curse-causing sin of murdering children within the womb. And now we are at a place where family is being threatened like never before because of the homosexual agenda and the transgender activities that are taking place in our schools and on Main Street USA, in Hollywood, and in our political arenas. Everywhere we go now, we're seeing this pressure to not just accept, but to endorse and to propagate homosexual activity. And this has become a violent, aggressive force, and it's so ungodly. There has been 27 different superpowers in history that have ruled a big swath of land and a lot of people, and some pretty well the whole world, the known world at the time. 27 different major powers. And do you know that the decline of those empires... I should mention before we go further that the last one of these superpowers is right here. It's the United States of America. But when decline comes, and it came to all of those 27 different superpowers, the very last thing that put the nail in the coffin was the acceptance of the gay agenda and transgender activity becoming popular in that empire. And every single case, it brought the ruin and the collapse of that superpower. Do you know of those 27 different superpowers, the average lifespan was 240 years from when they started in triumph 
to when they declined and came to ruin in a transgender gay mess. And right now, here in the United States, we have just gone past the 240 year mark. And the transgender assignment and conspiracy is strong in this land. And we need this to turn around. We need the family to be strengthened. We need the blessings of God to come back upon the United States. Now, the United States has done many things that are right. And because of it, we do have some lasting blessings. But if we were to vote, and I have to say, if we vote for anti-Christ and anti-God principles in this election, we will put ourselves on a slippery slope that will be like a toboggan in Canada going down a slippery uh, 90 degree slope that you can hardly stop and uh, it, it is deadly if it's long and deep. It's uh, like the luge or something that we're going to go down so quickly in this land. And most people are unaware of the gravity of this election and what is coming before us. But Christians, church, it's time for you to stand up and proclaim the laws of the Lord, the precepts of heaven, the glory of God, and don't back down and make this election a time when you take your stand and take a whole bunch of people with you and vote in person and vote for Donald Trump. I'm not shy to say it. It's not that I favor his personality. I actually don't. I think he really needs some sanctification and some help in that area. But God is working with him. And God put him in that place. And it's not a personality that we're voting for. It's the principles. It's the values and the, the policies of the Republican Party at this time. I would also say that I am not a Republican. And if the Republican Party in five years time turned anti-Christ and anti-Bible, uh, I would no longer be voting for the Republicans. But right now, they're lining up with the Bible, lining up with the foundations of this nation and stepping up for life and for family, and for church, and for Israel, and for the economy, and for helping the poor, and for law and order, and for safety. And those things are Bible things. Those things are godly things. And you shouldn't be shy about proclaiming it. I notice a lot of people don't wear red hats like they used to. And I know it's because there's a fear factor here. That uh, if you were a Democrat, uh, you can go out on the streets and nobody's going to mess with you. But if you're somebody who is going to vote for Donald Trump and you make it known, you don't know what kind of barrage of evil or violence might come against you. So there is a silent group of people, I think a great majority in this land, who are going to vote biblically. They're going to vote for the precepts and the, and the policies of the Bible and the group that is most lined with that, without a doubt, is Donald Trump and the Republican Party. Amen? Amen. Those watching online, you may just have shut me off, but I hope not. Because I love you, and I want, especially if you're a Christian, for us to be so unified in the purposes of God. And I love people of all color. I don't like the Black Lives Matter movement. Please don't misunderstand me, but I love black lives. I have an aunt who's black. Two black people were in our wedding party, my best friends. And if anybody knows me, they know I love people of every color and every race and every nation. I do with all my heart. And I treat each one the same, and it's just a natural thing. But the movement itself is not godly. It's communist. And 
it, it approves of the gay agenda. And it's full of anarchy. And wants to destroy the things that God has put in place. So let it be shouted from the housetops. I'll shout it from the platform. You shout it from your home. Shout it from your housetop. And there's a lot of people I discovered who do not know the details. They see something on TV. They hear something from a certain news network. And they don't see the details. And they become emotionally involved and are going in a wrong direction and don't realize, even Christians are not aware that they're voting for ungodly, antichrist, anti-God policies that will turn this nation on its head and bring it to ruin if we go down that path. So let me talk about these non-negotiables for a nation. First of all, I want to speak to you about the family. Would you open your Bible with me to the book of Mark? In Mark chapter 10, I'm going to start reading in verse 6. It says in Mark 10 verse 6, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. So here we have this description of marriage. God made male and he made female. At the beginning of creation, God invented marriage. And since that time, all through history, it has been the normal tradition of humanity for a man, one man and one woman to be married and to come together to become one flesh and with God's grace and blessings to raise children, to raise a family. That's the biblical picture. And do you know that the Republican Party's stand on marriage is very simple. They believe that marriage is the union, the legal union of a, one man and one woman. And you know it was that way in the Democratic Party just 12 years ago when President Obama came into power and he said that he believed that marriage was between a man and a woman. But it was a very short space of time after he was elected that all of a sudden he flipped and he says no it's for any two people who want to come together in, in intimacy and in union, that they should have all the rights of a married couple. And now the Democratic Party puts it out there very clear in their policy. They believe that marriage is any two people, same sex, whatever, any two people who want to be together legally can be together in marriage. And that's the policy of that a Democratic Party. Now, this is a difficult issue to fight from a political situation because a president has to be the president of everybody in the nation. Sinners and saints. But I, I want you to know that Donald Trump is very much in favor of the biblical family. And on February the 22nd, just after he came into power, the Department of Education in conjunction with the Department of Justice rescinded President Obama's guidance that required public schools to allow transgender students to use bathrooms and showers of their choice. Obama had put it into play that children in our schools, on sports teams and, and uh, having physical education, could go into the showers of people of the opposite sex if they said, I don't feel like I am a boy, or I don't feel like I'm a girl, even though biologically I am, I'm deciding to be the opposite. And the Democrat 
party said, that's okay, you can use any bathroom you like, and you can use any shower you like. And uh, there was a, a, a terrible uh, fight against this by Christian moms and dads, and not just them, but just decent people who don't want somebody of the opposite sex in the bathroom uh, in their schools. But uh, it was just in 2017, just within the first month that, uh, Ob that uh, Trump was in power on February the 22nd. So he just got, just said his, he just was uh, incorporated as the president and he rescinded, the first thing he did, he rescinded that law in favor of the family and came against this transgender uh, nonsense. And he's been doing that. Amen. I wish he was here to hear your clap. He's been doing that, uh, that kind of thing, ever since he got into power. In fact, every month he does something for the family or for religious freedom. You don't hear it all. But he goes through all these steps, one after the other. And uh, on August of that same year, President Trump announced changes to the Obama administration's Department of Defense policy, which had allowed military personnel to serve if they were openly transgender. And Donald Trump put an end to it. And he stopped that. Uh, he announced changes to it. He said, if you're already in there, we won't take you out. But from now on, no, no new people coming in who are openly transgender. He said it, it was a danger to people who are out there as soldiers fighting in the field if they have that kind of a transgender person uh, with them. And uh, he also... Uh, did some other things. In 2019, I'm skipping through all of these things. Let's go to 2020. And uh, in 2020, on March the 24th, which is just this year, his administration filed a statement of interest in the case protecting women against men intruding on their sporting competitions. The statement made clear that athletic qualifications on the basis of gender identity were harmful to women's sports. So somebody who was a man who says, I think I'll be a girl, was getting into women's sports with uh, different DNA and made it very unfair. And so Donald Trump put an end to that. And he has been such a fighter, as much as he can be, for the family. And I praise the Lord for him and for everything that he has done. Now this thing of being family, as we've said, is God's idea. He invented it. He invented marriage between one man and one woman. And we go to the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, we read, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. He said for this reason, the reason being that every marriage between a husband and a wife is a picture of the church and Jesus Christ. 
We are the bride of Christ. And every woman is representative of the church, of the bride of Christ. And every husband is representative of the Lord, of Christ. And the two of them must come together in harmony and in unity and serving one another and blessing. And it is so important. It's part of God's eternal plan. And I encourage you to get my book, which is called Understanding God's Great Plan. A Jewish Christian Bible perspective. And in it, one of the chapters is about the importance of marriage and the family. And of course, how it compares and is a picture of the church and the Lord Jesus and our unity with him. So when this is violated by some transgender or gay gathering of two people together and calling it marriage, it's like a slap in the face of the creator. It is an affront. It is an antichrist spirit. And there are two spirits that are so dangerous right now in the United States. And one is the murderous abortion spirit. And the other is this gay transgender homosexual spirit. And, the, and two of them are like trains going down a track at bullet speed and they're they're out for the ruination of this nation and it's time that the church stood up and called sin sin and said this is not our nation now we can't stop sin but you know what they say you can't stop a bird from landing on your head but you can stop him from building a nest And it's time that the church said, this nation belongs to Jesus Christ. And we are the people of God. And we take a stand for goodness and that which is virtuous and that which is holy and that which is righteous. So the first of God's non-negotiables for a nation is marriage. The union of one man and one woman. It's the foundation of our culture of our society of our nation the second non-negotiable from God for a nation is life Proverbs 24 verse 11 tells us about this Proverbs 24 verse 11 says rescue those being led away to death hold back those staggering towards slaughter. And here is a call for us to protect those who are going to be killed. And the most vulnerable that's going to be killed is the unborn baby. Since Roe versus Wade, almost, well, more than actually, a million children are killed in the United States every year. So much so that there's 60 plus children who have been murdered, who have been aborted in the womb since 1973 when Roe versus Wade became acceptable in this land. This has brought a curse upon the United States of America. It's the reason that the Great Tribulation will come. All around the world, do you know that every year 60 million babies are killed in the world this is the greatest attack against our minority people our black brothers and sisters and their community are being attacked in the womb more than are being allowed to be born So much so that almost a thousand African-American babies are aborted every day in America. It's a crime against that, that people group. And do you know that people like Planned Parenthood have put their abortion factories within walking distance of the poor communities in the land. 
the majority of them, are right in walking distance of our poorest communities. And they target them because the poorest communities are often the ones that have the most abortions. This is a tragedy and a travesty. But Donald Trump and the Republican Party, individuals within it, there's so many of them who are born-again Christians, and they stand for life. And they're looking for a reversal of Roe versus Wade. I would say it is the focal point of the battle right now. Because, you know, it seems that not too many people can fight against this gay agenda. But we can certainly come right out and fight for the life of the unborn child. And Roe versus Wade is reversible. And already, just within these first four years of the Trump administration, two Supreme Court judges were put on the seat there so that we have a balance between liberal and conservative, between abortionist-thinking people and pro-life people. And I will prophesy that if Donald Trump gets into power again, he will have the opportunity of putting another conservative judge on the seat, which in time has the great potential to overturn abortion in the United States of America. He not only has put these two judges on the Supreme Court, but has put in place 200, more than any other president, he has put 200 pro-life judges, conservative judges, on seats all around the country. This is amazing. And we thank God for his fight in this regard. But let me read a few things to you of his accomplishments that you might not be aware of. But on January the 23rd of 2017, just when Donald Trump got into power, President Trump reinstated and expanded the Mexico City policy, which blocks funding for international organizations that perform or promote abortion. All around the world, yeah, praise God, the United States was giving annually $8.8 .8 billion to family planning in poor nations around the world that was paying for abortions. And within the first month, Donald Trump stopped it. And he said that we will no longer be paying for organizations in any nation that performs abortions. We praise God for his determination and his fight in this regard. He has done so many things for life. I mentioned the various judges that he has put in place but that's not all that he has done. On January 24th, President Trump became the first sitting president to give remarks in person at the annual March for Life in Washington, D.C. The first one to have the guts and the courage to stand up with those who were marching for life. And this was in 2020, just in January of this year. And he gave a speech to protect the unborn child. And on March 24th of this year, this administration filed a statement of interest in a case protecting women against men intruding. Oh, I'm reading you the wrong thing. Let me give you this one. May the 12th, the Trump administration 
has overseen the confirmation of 193 federal judges, including two Supreme Court judges and 51 federal appeals court judges. He has been fighting for life every chance he gets. And has stopped the funding for Planned Parenthood. And he is anxious to see life and protection for the unborn child. So we can rejoice with what he has done and what he is still doing. And we need him. You know what? If this were the only issue, it would be enough for us to vote in that direction for pro-life. If we didn't agree with anything else, just the pro-life issue alone is enough for us to put the X on that box and say we're going to vote for the Republican Party because they're pro-life. So there's a blessing when you fight for life. When you defend those who cannot defend themselves. Now it is not just about the life in the womb. It's all life. You know, black lives matter. I don't mind us lifting it up and saying black lives matter because they certainly do. And I like the words of T.D. Jakes when he said, during the month of October, they all wear these purple or pink ribbons because it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And they said, that doesn't mean we don't believe that there should be an end to liver cancer or pancreatic cancer, but that doesn't stop us from saying, this month, we're going to celebrate and focus on breast cancer awareness, and we'll wear these pink ribbons. Well, in the same way, we can stand. There's nothing wrong. I mean, you don't have to always say, well, all lives matter, as if to discredit uh, their efforts to save themselves and to fight for their, for their people. It's okay. We can fight with them, but not the movement. Not the movement that's anarchistic and communist and is against the purposes of God. But we need to understand that this year there has been 13 African American unarmed men who have been shot by police. 13. It's a tragedy. Because they've been shot and killed. Do you know how many white people, white men, have been shot and killed by police this year? Unarmed white men? 200. But they're not shown on TV. Do you know just in Chicago this weekend, 50 people were shot by black-on-black -black violence, gang violence, and 10 were killed, including a little girl. And that's just one city. And life is precious. And black lives matter there too. And that's why we need law and order. We need this to be turned around. The nation responsibility before God is to protect life from the womb till the end for seniors and people in our poorest minority neighborhoods are the most vulnerable it seems those and the ones in the womb but I believe that our president will fight for life. And he will make, he will find a way to fight for life and to protect life. So these two things so far. Godly marriage is a non-negotiable. Protecting life is a non-negotiable for our nation. Lastly, a non-negotiable for a nation is to bless Israel. 
In Genesis chapter 12, the Lord spoke to Abraham. And he said, Abraham, I will bless you. And whoever you bless will be blessed. And he says, whoever blesses you, I will bless. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And this is for you and your descendants. Jerusalem, the Bible says, is the joy of the whole earth. How can it be? How can a city be the joy of the whole earth? The Lord says that he doesn't want us to give him any rest. And he's not going to give us any rest until he makes Jerusalem the praise of the whole world. The praise of all the nations. The reason is because one day Jesus is going to put his throne in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. And from that place he's going to rule the nations. So Jerusalem represents the government of God. That's why it's beautiful beyond description. That's why it's the joy of the whole earth. Because it's the place that represents the government and the kindness and the compassion and the mercies of Jesus to cover the whole, the whole world. All people and all nations. And the Lord has chosen them. He says, I have chosen you above every other nation in the world. And he says, I have put my name in Jerusalem. And I have put my blessings there. And he says that those people are the apple of his eye. They are, he says he's engraved them on his hands. And even though they walked away from the Lord in rebellion, he will bring them back unto himself. And in the end, he will cause them to be the hosts of the nations and the servants around the king of kings. So when we try to sidestep the plan of God, we get ourselves in trouble. So he makes it very clear. Bless that nation. Bless those people. And I will bless you. In Joel chapter 3, we read about the battle of Armageddon. And the Bible says, the Lord says that he will bring the nations together to judge them on how they have treated Israel. He says, because you've divided up my land and you've sold my sons and my daughters for wine and for prostitution. Therefore, I will judge you, says the Lord, in Joel chapter 3. So it's about not just our salvation, but it's about the nation of Israel. You know, at the end of the age, there's sheep nations and goat nations. And the sheep nations are the nations that bless Israel. And the goat nations are the ones who persecute Israel. But there's an amazing thing that's happening. A shift, a paradigm shift towards Israel between the Obama and the Trump administration. Now Israel has already be, always been supported by America. And one of America's end time destiny callings is to partner with Israel and to support Israel. There's no doubt about it. And we are connected beyond the wishes or ways of a single president. It's the heart of God. But Donald Trump somehow has stepped up to the plate. Maybe it's because he has 60 pastors on his religious council who meet with him every few months and give him advice. But one of the things that he learned is that you better bless Israel. If you want this nation to be blessed, you better bless Israel. And so he has. The first thing being to move 
the embassy from Tel Aviv, where my mother was born, to Jerusalem, the first nation in history to do this. Some eight presidents promised they would do it, but they weren't courageous enough. But it's like he wakes up courageous. And he just did it. And he says it's the right thing to do. Jerusalem is the oldest capital in the world. The oldest capital city in the world. I don't know if Donald Trump understands that Jesus is coming. And that he's going to put his throne in that place. Then Jerusalem is not just the, the capital of Israel. It's the capital of the whole world. That's the place Jesus will rule from. And all the nations will come up there. So that's an amazing thing that he did. And that alone brings blessings on the United States of America. He's also affirmed the Golan Heights and the West Bank as legally part of Israel. And just this past month, he brokered this peace treaty of naturalizations between a Muslim nation, the United Arab Emirates, and Israel. This, he should get the peace award, the Nobel Peace Award, and somebody uh, suggested it today. Yeah. Whether or not he gets it is another question. But he deserves it. And just this past week, the first airline flew from Israel, crossed over for the first time in history, Saudi Arabia, and landed in Abu Dhabi. Now they have regular flights starting up. And they have naturalized relationships. And it is now happening with Serbia and Kosovo, another Muslim nation. Just today, this is starting to happen. So the gears are moving. And this is such a blessing. And Donald Trump has been the one to make this happen. So there are some non-negotiables. And even though we're not there, we have somebody in the White House who wants us to be there. Wants us to protect the biblical family and marriage as we know it between one man and one woman. And wants to see the sanctity of life in the womb and life everywhere to be seen as precious and to be protected. And this is the first job of any government is to protect its people from danger from afar or close at hand. And I believe he takes it very, very seriously and would overturn, would love to see Roe versus Wade overturned and no more abortion in this land. And the third non-negotiable thing that he definitely has done is to support Israel, the promised land, and the Jewish people like no other president in our history. It's amazing. For me, I can put up with some of his character flaws if his policies line up with God. Because those are kingdom of God policies. There should be no division in the church. I started off this talk tonight by referring to the giant redwoods. 300 feet high with only 6 feet deep roots. But you know those roots, they stretch out for a hundred feet in every direction. And they intertwine with the roots of all of the other trees, with other redwood trees, so that when the storms come, the trees 
are hugging each other underground and they don't tip over. And that's a picture of the church. And I'm not just talking about Antioch International Church, although we should be so united as one people in one voice. But the church all across America should be like those redwood trees. We should have our branches going out in every direction. And this fall we will be meeting with other churches to lift up the name of Jesus together and to be a unified people. We'll do it on several occasions with prayer as we come towards this election. But we're probably also going to do it on a Sunday morning sometime this fall. There's a breakthrough for us. And we're excited about it. So let the red roots, the redwoods with shallow roots <laughs> embrace each other and hold each other up in our frailty. Let us be unified in Christ and let us see this kingdom, the kingdom of God flourishing in America. One nation under God lifting high the name of Jesus Christ. Let's be that people who sing it from the housetops. There is no God like the God of Israel. He is Savior of the world. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. And He is the King of the United States of America. Amen. Amen. Please stand to your feet. Let's pray together. Those of you watching online, please stop what you're doing and say this prayer with us. Hold your hands out. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. And bless the United States of America. Help our president now to be strong, to be righteous, and to put forth the biblical principles of your kingdom. Bless his administration. Lord, we ask that you would come against evil and wickedness and every spirit of lawlessness and every antichrist spirit, that its power would be broken over the United States of America, and that your blessings would go from sea to shining sea the covering of the Lord over our children. We speak your blessings now over this nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Put your hand on your heart and let me bless you. Those watching online, stop what you're doing and put your hand on your heart right now and just receive this blessing. You don't need to repeat. In the name of Jesus. I speak the blessings of the Lord over your life for the goodness of the Lord and the benefits of the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit to overshadow you. I speak health in your body. Those of you who have this virus, this coronavirus, I break its power off of you. I come into the prayer of agreement and I speak health in your body in Jesus' name. I speak health in your heart now from all the fears and worries of the day the turmoil that has come and affected you I pull it off you in the name of Jesus and I speak the joy and blessings of the Holy One of Israel over your life and I speak peace into your house and into your, among your relatives and your family and the joy of the Lord in your heart and I speak the purposes of God into your future to speak through your mouth with boldness and to be everything that you're to be right now in this hour to fulfill your assignments. I speak it over you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night and God bless you.